Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Coffee and Prayer. I'm Pastor Andrew F. Carter, and it's 5.30 a.m. here in Inglewood, California. As you guys are tuning in, please let me know where you are and what time it is. It is Saturday morning here. We are up bright and early, ready to jump into our devotions, 1 Timothy chapter 2, as well as uh, Proverbs chapter 30. So good morning, good morning. This is a worldwide ministry, you guys, people from around the world. My brothers and sisters from around the world gather together for the scripture. What's up, Cody? What's up, G? ATL's in the house. Brother Rob? What's up, Tama? There we go. Uh, we've got Sister May. Ohio's in the house. we got people from all around the world. The Netherlands, Brazil, Miami. Good morning. Good morning. ATL. That's what I'm talking about. It's funny. Uh, you know, people have commented on my accent and the way that, um, you know, I pronunciate the, the Latin verbiage. And, um, I must say it's this Duolingo, right? I'm, this is a shameless plug. I'm just, I, I promise you, I'm not getting a kickback. I'm not getting any kind of promotional deal or fee. I, I, I like, I'm kind of a guy who likes streaks, right? And, uh, before you like let your imagination run wild. The streak that we have going on here at Coffee and Prayer has been about what's like 197 days to be exact, somewhere around there, 196, 197, maybe 198. I don't know. All I'm saying is this. Uh, I have a streak on Duolingo, which is about 140 days. Shortly after we started Coffee and Prayer, I started doing Duolingo. Duolingo is an app that you can use that helps you with whatever language it is that you uh, you want to get better at. And so I have been practicing Spanish for 140 days, somewhere around there in a row and uh, uh, really loving it. And it's it's fun. It's challenging. I, I like to do things consistently. And um, boy, oh boy, do I love that. That is a shout out. That is an absolute shameless plug for Duolingo. If you want to get better at a language and you like to, to work on things and you like to be consistent, it gives you a reminder. You pop on there every night before bed or, or in the morning or sometimes, you know, if I get bored, instead of me playing a game on my phone, I'm practicing another language. It's beautiful. And I love it. So I might have missed it. Um, can, can somebody throw up the scripture for today? <laughs> Links in my bio. You guys can use the code. Knock it off. It's not even that serious. See, si, Puerto Rican. There we go. And now I, I butchered it, right? I butchered it. I, I tried to like show off. See, pride comes before a fall. If you guys don't know, pride comes before a fall. As soon as you like start to, you know, pat yourself on the back, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm pretty good at Spanish and pronunciation. And then I butcher it right? I'm embarrassed and ashamed of myself. So let's pray. We're going to jump into 1 Timothy chapter 2. We've got some controversial scripture to go over. Talking about women in ministry, this is arguably one of the most taken out of context scripture, also one of the most manipulated, uh, used, and abused scriptures. It's one that is uh, really a topic of dissension. There is a lot of argument. There is a lot of division. There's a lot of stuff that goes on around 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to jump right in today. It's going to be beautiful, right? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for your truth. God, we invite Holy Spirit to challenge us today. We want the confrontation because when we are confronted by truth, we are changed and transformed. Right now, Lord, we pray that we would leave our preconceived notions, ideas, and opinions to the side. God, we want you. We want to leave this place changed. We want to leave this place transformed. We want to know you better. And at the end of this time that we spend together, Lord, we want to leave here filled with love, um, with a deeper, better understanding of who you are, God, with more wisdom and uh, just just leaving here in a manner that brings glory and honor to you. So God, have your way with us. Have your way with us during this time. Soften our hearts. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. First and foremost, man, uh, First Timothy starts out really good. Right. We've, I mean, the whole the, the Bible's good. Let's just get that out there. And uh, but but what it's talking about, it says, first, I tell you to pray for all people, asking God for what they need and being thankful to him. I love this. Pray for all people. 
right? Pray for all people, whether you believe, you agree with them or not, whether you like them or not, whether they are living in sin or not. Be praying for everybody, right? As we pray for each other, one of the things that we typically do, and I'm at a huge emphasis, is everybody has a prayer request. And I love that. We I love praying for people. But at the end of the day, my prayer is that God would supply and give you what you need, not what you want. Because we have a tendency as human beings, selfish individuals, we all have a hint of self there's that remnant of flesh that each of us are battling daily, right? We have a tendency to want things that God might not want for us, right? Myself included. There's things that uh, might stem from a, a, a hint of selfishness or self-centeredness. And I'm real with God. I'll be like, God, these are the things that I want. If these aren't a part of your plan, then take them away. And I'm very aware that sometimes there's things that I want, there's places I want to go, there's things that I want to do that are more selfish and revolve around myself that might not be there planted from God. And my prayer is that his will would be done and not mine. And I shared this last week that I had a bout of bad news or some discouragement because things didn't work out my way and that lasted for 15 minutes and I had to remind myself to practice what I preach. If it's not going my way, then it's going his way. And I, I don't know about you, but I want his way over my own. I understand that my way has led me down very dark paths. My way has led me to rock bottoms. My way has been rooted and grounded in selfishness. And I want to be a vessel for the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if it doesn't go my way, I understand it's going his way. And that's what we want. So my prayer when we're praying, and I believe it should be all of our prayer, is that we receive what we need and not what we want. And as we are praying for people, our prayer should be that God's will would be done in healing, in transformation, in finances, in relationships. Some of you might want your relationship to work out, yet God might have different plans for that relationship. Maybe that relationship isn't rooted in godliness. Maybe that relationship needs to go separate ways so the both of you can get healing. And so maybe in the moment, what you want isn't what's best for you, right? Am I talking to anybody out there? Has anybody ever wanted something that wasn't good for them? Right. Think of like that child, that child mentality, kids who want ice cream at midnight, knowing that it's not good for them. And some of you might be like, well, let him have the ice cream. No, because what's going to happen He's going to be high on sugar. He's going to stay up super late. His stomach's going to hurt. Then he's going to sleep in the next day. He's going to be cranky and upset. And it's going to be uh, uh, this big detrimental situation because he wants what he wants and he wants it when he wants it. But as a father or a parent, you don't give in to every want that your child has because you know what's best. And it's the same way. Many times we're praying and asking for things that we don't get because God knows that if we got them in the moment, in our current state, maybe we're not prepared. Maybe we're not mature. Maybe it's the very thing that will absolutely destroy us. He will answer our prayers with a no because he knows what's best. So our prayer many times is God, not only are we praying for everybody, for all people, but we're asking God to provide them what they need, not what they want. And even in the middle of that, we are thankful right? Well, we started off on fire this morning. Let's go, right? That's, oh, thank you guys for joining coffee and prayer. Hope you guys have an amazing, like, that's it. That's the sermon, right? If it was only that simple, that's the sermon, like it right there. Ooh, we're 10 minutes in and you guys already feel that Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. So listen, finding a position or a heart posture of gratitude, even when you're not getting what you want is a challenge, right? Let me say that again. Finding a heart posture or a position of praise when you're not getting what you want can be challenging, right? I'm praying and hoping and thinking and believing on this one thing. We're praying for people and we want them to get these things. But when it doesn't go the way that we want, it's hard to be thankful. It's hard to position yourself and go, ah, that's not what I wanted, but I'm still thankful. Ah, that's not what I wanted, but I'm still grateful. It takes time, it takes maturity, it takes growth, but it really comes with this understanding, right? As we root ourselves in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, which the Bible says is greater than gold and silver, and it's the thing that we should desire the most, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, as we ground ourselves and root ourselves in the fact that God is good and he wants what's best for us, even in the middle of our nose, we can be thankful because we're thankful because many times those no's are protecting us, they're redirecting us, they're saving us from a lot of harm, they're keeping us from settling for less. So even those no's have God's love and goodness written all over them. 
So in that place, even in the face of no's and, and the no's might, the no's might come with grief. The no's might come with hurt. The, the no's might come with suffering and pain. But even in the middle of the suffering, grief and pain, we understand that God is good. So even in the middle of those feelings and emotions and the understanding that his no is an answer to our prayer, we must remain thankful and grateful. Amen. Wow, we got all that from verse one. Glory to God. So that's First Timothy chapter two, verse one. Um, verse two has quite a bit of, of of food, meat and potatoes. Man, this is what I've been waiting for. This I've been waiting for something to ah just go. It says, pray for rulers and for all who have authority, so that we can have quiet and peaceful lives, full of worship and respect for God. This will challenge some of y'all. I know it will because some of you guys have allegiances to your political parties that are greater than your allegiance to God. Woo, did he just say that? Wow, I did. I'm gonna repeat it for those for those in the back, right? For those in the back before you spit your coffee out. Some of you have greater allegiance to your political party than you do to the scripture, to the word of God, to the Lord our God. You guys understand what I'm saying? Some of you are so filled with hatred and anger, frustration and uh, frustration, frustration and discouragement from what happened in the election that you can't humble yourself to pray for the very individual who is in office at this moment. Some of you guys are still making excuses and 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 and, and coming back to the point that it was cheated and that it was you some of you are still hung up on unforgiveness, you're still hung up and frustrated from the results, whether it was legit or not. Some of you are still hung up on the results of what happened in the presidential election that you will not humble yourself and pray for the very individual who is in office right now. And if that's you, if you're, if right now you're coming up with excuses and you're getting flustered in your spirit, this is for you. This is for you. Pray for rulers and for all who have authority, whether he's there, whether he's there by by being cheated, by manipulation, by, uh, you know, fudging the numbers, whatever it is, man, whatever it is, some of you are more loyal and have allegiance to your political party and your political stance and you do for the word of God, because the word of God, the scripture, the truth, God is saying, pray for the rulers and all who have authority. So that we can have quiet and peaceful lives full of worship and respect for God. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, we have to be praying for these individuals. Right? We need to be praying for these individuals. Amen? I'm going to leave that right there. It's also important why when there are controversial topics and subjects like uh, Wade versus Roe, uh, Roe versus Wade, we've got um, these different uh, situations when it comes to the government and and the things that are going on in the political arena, why we as Christians must be praying, right? Why we must be praying. Somebody asked me this <clears throat> the other day with everything that's going on in this nation with uh, the overturning of the controversial um, subject of abortion. Somebody asked me why I don't post about it. And I was, I, I mean, my, my answer is simple, right? Everybody else is. And, and it's not that I'm not doing my part. It's not that I'm not praying. It's not that I'm not, I don't have an opinion. My opinion is biblical. Know this, know that I have a biblical stance on all of these controversial topics, anything when it comes to, uh, you know, headline or mainstream issues and people want to see me get involved in politics and to make this hard stand and to draw the line. I do draw the line. I draw the line by getting up every morning and following scripture. I draw the line by getting up and praying. I, get, I draw the line by, um, by, by preaching and, and sharing the truth and sharing the gospel. Um, one thing that I refuse to do and God's never, this isn't a conviction, right? This isn't my platform. God doesn't put that on my heart. I don't care about losing followers. If I did, I wouldn't be here talking about the things that I do. Um, but a lot of people already are talking about it. I still want to create a safe space for those who are on the other side where they can come hear the word. And I believe that by preaching the truth with love and empathy, they will be in the presence of God and God does the changing. 
right? God does the changing. And so I don't, also I feel, and this is my personal opinion, I feel like sometimes people just jump on whatever's controversial in order to stay trending and in order to stay relevant. And so they'll put their opinion and they'll chime in and they'll jump on whatever bus is going in this direction. And there's really no consistency. They pick and choose the things that they want to, you know, really support and be a part of. And, and, and I understand that it's important, but it, I, I just think that sometimes it's you're doing it in order to stay trendy, in order to stay relevant or to jump on whatever popular topic. One week it's talking about Kanye not being a Christian. The next week it's about abortion. And then they're just kind of jumping from controversial topic to controversial topic. And what you'll see is I don't address any controversial topic, not just politics, but really any of the stuff that's going on when it comes to posting, right? When it comes to posting. For me, it's... Uh, it's just not what God's called me to do. And it's not for fear of losing followers. It's just for fear of losing who God has called me to be um, and being swayed with everything that's in the headlines. It's my personal opinion. It's my personal um, It's my personal platform that God has allowed me to have. And so um, that's a response to that. Nobody here asked. You guys understand and you guys know where I stand because I talk about it on a daily basis. Clout chasing, that's exactly a great, uh, that's a great way to put it. And again, I'm not sitting in a seat of judgment. It's their platform and they feel led. And also, I'll be honest with you guys, um, I haven't, I've never taken a big, so I'll share this. This is raw, real and honest and transparent. Um, I've never voted, right? I've never voted. And I want to share with you guys why. And before you guys lose your mind, and it's our Christian duty, it's our civic duty to vote. The reason is because I can't, right? I can't. Before I was 18 years old, uh, I committed uh, enough crimes. Um, I had felonies. And in the state of Oregon, there was a, a bill that was passed where I lost my rights to vote. And so I'm still on that. Uh, I'm heading in the direction of restoring my rights as a United States American. Like I just said, I just got my passport. I'm 37 years old and I just received my passport. Uh, the way that I lived and the crimes that I committed um, prevented me from leaving the country. And uh, it's not like I'm some international mastermind criminal. I just was stupid. I started selling drugs and getting in trouble and, and doing things. Um, I got a burglary when I was 18 years old, right? And someone says, in California, you can, right? I just moved here. I just moved here. So I'm not sure of the laws. Uh, and I haven't trans, I haven't transferred all of my stuff to California. So in, in the, the 20 years that I've been able to do so, I haven't been able to do so because of how I, uh, how I came up, how I grew up. And so, um, you know, yeah, it's one of those things where, I understand the importance of politics. I understand the importance of voting and putting that out there. But again, the way that I lived my life, I wasn't concerned about politics or voting because I was more concerned about putting food on the table, right? And, and this was my mindset. The way that I grew up, my mom didn't vote. My, my, my parents, they didn't do that. We lived on the system. There wasn't this emphasis in politics. There wasn't an emphasis in government of knowing your... The only emphasis that we had was like when we dealt with the government was going to court because we had charges and cases. Uh, the only thing is when I was getting taken from my mom and I was a ward of the state and I was put in foster care. So from a young age, I had a lot of, um, a lot of distance between me and the law, me and the court systems, right? With between me and, uh, and, and the government system, I've never had a really good, uh, relationship. And so, and this, and this is what, uh, this represents a lot of people. Right. There, there's some people who grow up in families that are gung ho about politics. And, um, you know, and I had this conversation with a friend the other day. I just I never took an interest in it because it was painted as this bad thing growing up. And so as I get older, right, as I uh, am saved and am now, you know, really becoming a responsible adult and knowing who Christ is, I'm understanding the importance and I'm now stepping into that arena and having a greater understanding. But now as I want, I have the desire, the want and the, the need to know these things, uh, there are some roadblocks that uh, I've stepped into because of my past. So I just share that that that's another that's another reason. That's another reason. Uh, so moving forward, 
right? The point is that we need to be praying for everybody, regardless of your political party, regardless of whether or not you agree with who's in office or who's there. We need to be praying for a change of heart. Remember that Paul was once Saul, right? If you think that anybody is beyond the love of God, that anybody is beyond the transformational power of Jesus, you're missing the point of the gospel. The gospel is good news. Do you guys understand that? The gospel is good news. So we can have our stance. Oh, well, they're so evil or they've done this and there's no, who are we to sit in the seat of judgment? You don't know. Saul was once persecuting and, and jailing Christians. He was public enemy number one to the church of Jesus and then become became one of the most prolific writers and influencers of the New Testament. So imagine us writing somebody off because we don't agree with them or because we think that their sin is so great and they're in a position of power and watch because of the power of our prayers, they're transformed. And because they're in a position of power, that transformation that they go through helps them establish some things in the government and in politics that are transformational. You know what I mean? So, so who are we to sit in these seats of judgment and cross our arms and turn our back and decide not to pray for these individuals when clearly we're instructed to do so? It says, uh, this is good, man. As we pray for all people and we ask that God's will would be done here on this earth as it would be in heaven uh, and being thankful, it says, this is good and it pleases God, our savior, who wants all people to be saved and to know the truth, right? It's God's desire that all people, even the one that you count off, even the one that you don't forgive, even the one that you've turned your back on, even the one that you says there's no hope for, every person, God desires that all people would be saved and know the truth. There is one God in one way human beings can reach God. Right? Verse 5, there is one God in one way human beings can reach God. That way is through Christ Jesus. He gave himself as a payment to free all people. He is proof that came at the right time. Jumping down, it says in verse 8, so I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up their hands in a holy manner without anger and arguments. Woo. I want men to pray everywhere. I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up their hands in a holy manner without anger and without arguments. We are so quick to argue. We're so quick to divide. We're so quick to have a, a, an opinion about things that we know nothing about, right? Think about that. We are so quick to argue, even in lives, even in comment sections of Christian posts, we're so quick to argue about things we know nothing about. So quick to get angry. This is where it gets controversial, right? This is where it gets controversial. Verse nine, woo! It says, also women should wear proper clothes that show respect and self-control not using braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. Instead, they should do good deeds, which is right for women who say they worship God. So I chuckle at this um, because many, I've gotten a lot of DMs about women saying, oh my gosh, uh, so I shouldn't wear my hair in a braid, right? That it's, that it's, um, that it's evil or it's wicked or we're commanded not to braid our hair. So this is the context of the situation, right? Paul's not talking about a specific hairstyle that's evil, right? <laughs> He's not saying braided hair makes you bad or evil, okay? What this means, listen, in the context, in the time, the culture that they lived in, to have your hair braided was this. It was expensive. It was also extremely time consuming. So if a woman showed up to church with her hair braided, that meant that she was extremely self-centered. She put a lot of investment and time into herself and the way that she looked. It was a very, very big time commitment. It was a very big financial, uh, financial, um, uh, investment. It was a financial investment. So it wasn't like, Hey, I'm sitting with my girlfriend and she can braid my hair in five to 10, 15 minutes. It wasn't like that in these times in the context, he's talking about this, right? And it's not evil or wicked. If you wear gold, gold or pearls or expensive clothes in this time, they were the, the, the church that 
Timothy was a part of, the church in Ephesus, there was an emphasis on there were women in positions of power. They were false teachers. They were rising in this place and they were creating an atmosphere where women were being domineering. They were being disruptive in the church during worship and they were trying to snake their ways into positions of power, authority, and title. Also, while they were coming to church, it was becoming a who's who. It was a, it was a, it was a show of status. And so women were getting dulled. They were doing these expensive and elaborate hairdos and they were wearing these big gaudy chains and it was all for show, right? Does that make sense? Elaborate hairstyles is a great way to translate this. So if you got a girl who comes to church, church with her hair braided it's not don't like oh my gosh put her in the back she's filled with the devil because her hair's braided that wasn't what's going on he was using this braided hair was an elaborate hairstyle that took a lot of time and it was extremely consuming right and so um really the point is is here hey Understand that when you're coming here, this isn't about you. This isn't a fashion show. This isn't the Met Gala. This isn't the red carpet. You're here to worship God. So when you come here, do you know you should do good deeds, which is right for women who say they worship God. You should do so in a controlled and orderly manner, in a way that is appropriate, right? That, uh, in a way that is appropriate. This is God's house. This is this isn't about you. So so this is what oh a parade of self indulgence. Come on. That's a, that's a word right there. So <clears throat> that's what that's about. I, you get so much, um, so much confusion about the hairstyle uh, or wearing gold or even pearls. Um, but understand the context, understand who it was written to and understand what was going on in the church at hand. Uh, here we go. Verse 11. This is controversial. It says, let a woman learn. I'm going to read all of it and then we're going to double back. We're going to read 11 and 12. So let a woman learn by listening quietly and being ready to cooperate in everything. But I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to listen quietly. Right? This was controversial. Not just now. Right? This isn't controversial. This isn't controversial just now. This was controversial when it was written. Okay, so think about this. In this time, in the context, women weren't really taught. Women weren't supposed to be learning. They were supposed to be quiet then. So this was controversial. We can't say that this was sexist or this was trying to keep women in a place at the time, especially in the Jewish religion, in the time and the culture that they lived in. Women were supposed to be barefoot, pregnant in the kitchen. There were not a lot of rights. There were not a lot of things going on here. It was controversial because Paul was saying, hey, I want women to learn. So in fact, he was sitting here arguing for women's rights in the time, the culture, and the context. He said, let a woman learn. Let a woman learn. So the emphasis is constantly thrown to the idea of like, oh, well, women are supposed to be quiet and sit and be in submission. No, no, no. Take a second and actually listen and look at the context, right? Let a woman learn. Let a woman learn. So he's sitting here fighting for this. He wants there to be order. He understands that there are women in this place. There are false teachers who are trying to manipulate and twist their way into positions of power. And here he's saying, okay, I understand that women have a place here in the church. They should have positions. There should be a place for them. I want them to learn. What he's doing is he is applying constructs for them to learn and to have a deeper, better understanding, right? It says, let a woman learn by listening quietly. He wants, he wants to add this emphasis. The church and the women in the place that they were, were disruptive. They were doing, they were, they were, they were, um, they were being not only disruptive, but they were also trying to be domineering. And so he says, let a woman learn by listening quietly and being ready to cooperate every, in everything. He says it twice. Listen quietly. He wants them to listen and he wants them to listen quietly. And when he says quietly, it's not about like in silence, like shh, don't say a word. But what he's saying is in a quiet demeanor, a way that's not disruptive, in a manner that is orderly, right? There's a system, there is an order to all things, right? In all things. So he wants you to learn. So he's saying, hey, we want you to learn. We love that. Let a woman learn. But when she does so, there's order and there's a manner in which we should be doing that. Being quiet, right? Being quiet and listening. 
And he says, I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, right? And he goes on in verse 13, because Adam was formed first and then Eve. So there's an order that God, that God created. He, Adam was first and then there was Eve. And Adam was not tricked, but the woman was tricked and became a sinner. So in contrast, right? Paul's saying Adam was first, Eve was second. Eve was tricked. Okay. And, and by her leading and having authority, she got him to take a bite of the apple, right? To, to, to eat of the fruit. So the woman was tricked and became a sinner, but she will be saved through having children. And if they continue in faith, love and holiness with self-control, there is an order to things. It's not that women can't be in positions and that women can't have authority, that women can't teach or help or that they don't have wisdom or knowledge. What he's saying is there is an order and that they're not to have this authority over the man, this, this great authority. There is this false teaching and the women in this church were trying to find positions of power that were ruling and having authority over the men in this church, right? And so what you guys, what, what I'm encouraging you guys to do is to go in and to do some research. Don't take my word for this. I want you guys to pray about this, right? I want you to pray about the order. I want you to pray about the understanding about, uh, the, the controversial topic. So, so, so many people skip over and immediately we jump to, oh, they want us to be quiet and submissive. No, no, no. He was fighting for the right. He wants women to, in a controversial time and culture, he was an advocate for, Hey, I love that. We want you to learn. We want you, but there's an order and there's a proper way to do so. And it, it, it's not because of the order that we want. It's because the order in which God created man and woman and the way that things are to flow. There is an order. There's a system. And what he wants is for it to be done in a proper manner, right? So what I'm encouraging you guys to do is to step in to your research closet to do some prayer and to go over second Timothy. And what I would do is, as uh, use your search engine of preference. And there's like a uh, blue letter, there's Bible ref, there's um, insight, there's uh, got questions, there's different resources that you guys can use. So go in and put first Timothy two eleven context or uh, you know, controversial issues, learn both sides, have a deeper, better understanding of the cultural context, the time in which it was written, the things that were going on, right? Don't take my word for it. I want you to do your own research. You guys have the same access to scripture. And if you're on your phone or a tablet and you have the internet, you're on social media, you have the same access to the resources and, uh, things that will give you guys a deeper and better understanding for something that has become extremely divisive and controversial. Amen. I, I, this is a part of uh, the discipling process. Um, don't use my opinion. Don't come to me, right? Don't come to me. Um, definitely do your own research. Don't rely on my understanding. God wants to give you understanding. He wants to give you deeper knowledge and wisdom, and he wants you to be able to defend your faith and have an understanding of what it is that you're reading. Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's jump over to Proverbs. Jump over to Proverbs chapter 30. This is good stuff, right? Controversial, but maybe not as controversial as you thought. When you put things, when you start to look at things through the lens of culture, context, um, the authority, who the letter was written, why it was written, when it was written, the backstory of what was going on in the church, it starts to make sense. And I understand how it can be confusing. I am in no way, shape or form a Bible scholar, right? A Bible scholar. Uh, I'm no, I'm in no way, shape or form a theologian, right? Or somebody who has gone, uh, you know, into these vast depths of the scripture. I am a guy in a Jeep who loves Jesus and I want to have a deeper, better understanding of the scripture. And so I read it and I look into it and I study it and we're doing this together. Have I gone through it before? Absolutely. But I'm also going through it again. And when I'm done, I'm going to go through it again. And when I'm done, we're going to go through it again. And we're going, and, and each time, here's what's crazy is each time I go through it, there's something new that is revealed, right? I have the, I have the inability 
to read scripture and get the same thing out of it time after time. The word of God is living, it's breathing, it cuts like a two-edged sword. It is constantly challenging, changing, and transforming my opinion, my outlook, and my views. All right? I'm not even the same person I was two days ago or two days before that or two months ago, two years ago, gosh, two decades ago, not even close to the same person. It is constantly moving, changing, and transforming me and challenging me. And as we go through this, I'm excited to see the changes that takes place in your life. Our opinions, our behaviors, our beliefs, our actions, all of those things start to change and to become more like Jesus's. It's beautiful, man. It's beautiful. So in chapter 30, um, <clears throat> there's only a couple verses I want to share. And, uh, We'll jump out of here. It's verse five, right? And it goes into exactly what I'm saying. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. The, the, wor the word of God, not only the word of God, because Jesus is the word, not only Jesus, but uh, the word, the scripture, right? Um, his presence, the Holy Spirit, all of it is so pure. And he is a shield unto them that put their trust in in him. When I think of shields, I just think of immediately, you guys, I'm sorry when I do this, but I, I think of Captain America, right? Gro and before you guys jump on my case, Marvel's evil and you shouldn't be looking at comic books. Like, hold on a second, man. I grew up in the nineties before I knew Jesus. I'd walk down to Circle K and I'd get a, an X-Man comic book for like 75 cents. I still got a bunch of them. I got my cards. I grew up a big Marvel fan. And the fact that they came into live action movies when I had the action figures, I had the toys, like is a kid's lifelong dream. I would lay on my bed and think about, man, if I could cast the, and this is in the nineties, I'd be like, okay, if I could do an X-Men movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger would be Colossus, right? I'm going to date myself because these were like the hot actors, the cool actors, the hip ones. And I was like, okay, Wolverine would be Jack Nicholson, right? And uh, Storm would be Halle Berry. And I would sit there and I would go through the list of who I would make, um, you know, the, 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 the live action heroes. And no, it wasn't Halle Berry at the time. It was like, um, it was Vanessa Campbell. Okay. You guys are probably like, I don't even know who these people are. Right. I don't even know who these people are. But anyway, when I think of this shield, I think of Captain America. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And Captain America's shield was just, it was so powerful, man. It could withstand the blast from like Iron Man. Like it, you, there was like really nothing that you could throw. That shield was made out of adamantium, I believe it was, uh, or vibranium, uh, which is like from Wakanda. It's some precious metal that's extremely strong. And he would use that shield and there was nothing that would come against it, man. It was just this shield that was super powerful. There was no blast. It even like blocked. Thor's hammer, right? And some of you guys are like tuning out right now. You're like, I'm out of here. This guy is an absolute nerd. But um, look, it is what it is. The Lord's shield is greater than vibranium. It's greater than adamantium. The Lord's shield is a strong tower and it blocks everything. He Imagine, I think about this. The things that do touch my life are allowed by God. So I can only imagine the things that God doesn't allow, right? Think about that. The things that are, the things that I do experience are allowed by God. Think about the things that he blocks. Think about the things that he doesn't allow, right? God is so good. God is so good. His word is pure and he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. My trust is in God. It's not in this world. It's not in, then this is, this has been my prayer. I'm doing the, the, the draw the circle, 40 days of prayer. Obviously we pray every day, but it's um, this intentional prayer and we're writing a journal. But as I was on my knees this morning, this, the, the goal is to get on your knees at the same time every day and establish this habit of full surrender and sub, um, submission. Just falling on your knees, face down and just saying, God, have your way. And this morning, it was just this, this idea of like, my trust is in him. It's all about him, man. It's all about him. It's not about anything but him. He's good, he's faithful, he's loving, he's kind, he's merciful. 
Um, I might not have everything I want. I might not be where I want to be. But um, he's got me right where he wants me. And I have everything that I truly need. And if I don't have it, I don't need it. There's a plan and a purpose today that um, he wants to use us for. And despite my wildest dreams, visions, and goals, if I don't have it this moment, I don't need it this moment. He's so good. He's so good. In verse 8, it says this, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. I love this verse, man. Remove me from vanity and lies. This world is filled with vanity, right? This world is filled with vanity. And, and this world is constantly lying to you, telling you that this world is about you. This life is about you. It's all centered about you, 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 you. We're constantly bombarded with images of what beauty is, right? The world's definition of beauty. Uh, they, they've created this idea of what it is to be beautiful, what it is to be successful, what it is to be happy. And it's all surrounded by vanity and lies. It's all self-centered. It's all about consuming as much as you can, looking a certain way, behaving a certain way, having a certain attitude or mindset. And these are all lies from the enemy. These are all lies that lead to destruction. These are all things that if you do adopt them, if you pursue the lies and the vanity that this world tries to sell you, you will end up empty. You will end up broken. You will never... Uh, you will never be satisfied. You will never find happiness. See, this world is consumed with pursuing happiness, yet the word tells us to pursue holiness. So my prayer is just like this. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Right? There, there's a verse in the Bible that says, God, don't give me so much money that I forget you, but don't make me so poor that I got to steal. Right? Don't make me so rich that I forget you. You see, many of the mega rich and people who have a lot, a lot of money are in a place where they don't need God. They don't need God. They have every, they are, they're their own gods in their mind. They can snap their fingers and get whatever it is that they want. Right? They can buy full social media uh, you know, tabloids. They can, the, the ultra rich can do things because they have the money, power, and respect that they don't need God. Many of the ultra and mega rich don't need God because they've become their own. And so they forget about him. And my prayer is the same thing. I, I, I don't want to have so much money that I forget about God because I can snap my fingers and make things appear in this moment, right? Many people who live like that, they don't want a God, they want a genie. And then I don't want to be, I don't want to be so poor that I've got to break the covenant of God and steal. I don't want to be in a place where I can't even put food on the table. So I've got to go out and commit crimes just to make things happen. Right, I want to find this balance. I want to be hey, ne I, 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 give me neither poverty nor riches. I want to be somewhere in the middle where I'm reliant on you. I'm living faith by faith. I want you know. I want to be provided for. I want to. Oh man, thank you, Jesus. I realized that when I was striving and pursuing life on my own terms and my own kingdom. I felt like I was constantly grasping for things. And it felt like even the money that I got would fall through my hands. It was like water in a colander. You know what a colander is? It's the bowl with all the holes. You usually put like spaghetti in there to rinse it. Or when you wash your grapes, you put them in there and you run the water and the water goes right through. That's how I felt like the money that I got, the success that I got when I was chasing my own kingdom. It was like trying to catch all that water in a colander. It was just coming through my hands and it was just like sifting through and I could never really get a hold of it. I could never accumulate it. I felt like I would get a big amount of money and before I knew it, it was completely gone. It says that money would grow wings like riches will grow wings like eagle and will like eagles and will fly away. And that's like it, like, like that's what it was like. But here as I'm pursuing God, my faith is in him. And now that I'm living, you know, faith to faith, I feel like there's provision along the way. There is this provision that is tangible. There is no preoccupation or being consumed by money or finances or lack or poverty. Like there's, there's no thought of that. As I'm pursuing them, it's like breadcrumb by breadcrumb. 
And the confirmation is that there's provision in that direction. And, and I keep going back to this picture. I'm excited as we finish Proverbs, we're going to jump into Genesis and then Exodus. And I'm excited to read the story with you guys of how God led his people out of Egypt. And, and he was leading the way. And along the way, there was provision, right? It was manna from heaven. It was water from a rock. He led them. And it, he didn't deliver them to the promised land uh, immediately. He was leading them and guiding them. And it was almost like the direction they were going was the direction of the provision. And, and I feel that same thing in my life. The, the manna, it wasn't gluten-free and it didn't come with sweet honey butter, but it was provision. It was enough. It would fill them, right? And the water from the rock, it would quench their thirst. It wasn't sparkling with a lime, but it was enough to quench their thirst. And so they weren't hungry, right? But they weren't fine dining. And so here, as I'm following and pursuing God, I, I pray that we all get to this place where we're being led by the provision. We're following the, the plan, the purpose, the will that God has for our life. Because along that line, he's leading us faith by faith, provision by provision. He's taking care of you. He's not putting you in a position that you're so rich, that you have so much that you will forget about God. But he's also not leading you to a place of poverty where you have to compromise your values and beliefs in order to survive. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Mm, mm, mm. God is so good. <sighs> so good. Oh, man. And the last thing I, I want to talk about is just the beauty of... Um, there's four things that are that are just two that are wonderful. Right? And this weekend, as... Uh, last weekend, I, I was... You know, Kyra and I, we got to this place and I was like, you, we need to get out of the house and we need to do more things now. Um, you know, not, not, we live in California. So things are relatively that we could do inexpensive. We have bikes. I'm looking at them. They're hanging on the wall. We have these old beach cruisers that were given to us. Um, we could throw those in the back of the Jeep, drive down to the beach and we can ride up and down the, the Pacific coast highway, right up and down the Pacific coast. We can go from Malibu to Santa Monica, you know, to hunting. Like we can go through Huntington Beach. We can hit Bennett. We can hit all these different places relatively free. Um, there's tons of trails and hikes and places that we can go. But as we were sitting in the house on a beautiful, day and we were both, you know, I, I look over and I'm like, what are we doing? We're both working. We're answering emails. We're creating programs for faith and fitness. We're both, it's a Saturday and it was just a beautiful day. And you can hear the bustle of outside. The birds were chirping and, you know, you can hear the, 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 elo, what is it? The elote man. He's walking around selling corn. You hear the ice cream truck and you got kids. And I'm just like, we got to get out the house, man. We got to get out of the house. And, and as you know, we were, we were praying about it. We're like, okay, next weekend for sure. So we've got plans to get out of the house. We don't know what we're going to do, but we're not going to be here just working. But it reminds me in verse 18, um, there, there be three things which are too wonderful for which I know not. And the first one is this, the way of an eagle in the air, right? The way of a serpent on a rock the way of a ship in the middle of a sea. And, and, and that right there, and the way of a man with a maid. We won't go over that one. But I'm, I'm thinking of the things, God's creation, man, is so beautiful. And there's this natural flow. There's this natural beauty. And, and things that many times we overlook, right? We overlook. Because uh, I was talking with my boy Jalen about this. We get so familiar with who God is that we forget how good God is. Listen, right? Think about this. We, you guys are stuck on the elote man. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? If anybody doesn't know what the elote man is, it's the corn guy and he's got the corn in the little little cart and uh, they put all kinds of, they got butter and they got Parmesan cheese or I don't even think that's the kind of cheese. And then they got uh, tahini and they got salt and pepper. You can put, anyway, look, we get so familiar with, how good God is that we forget how good God is. You know what I mean? We forget the very fact that you are breathing, right? Is an absolute miracle. But because we do it without thinking, we forget how amazing it is. The respiratory system, how intricate it is, how meticulous 
it is. We for, we forget because we become so familiar that we get used to it. We forget how the, the, the beauty of how earth works, how the water goes only to a certain point on the beach, how things grow and are restored and regenerated. And gosh, man, I just think of like a, a discovery channel picture, this view of nature and animals and wildlife and things in the ocean and birds in the air. And I mean, just life in general, we become so familiar with it that we forget the beauty of it. You know what I mean? We forget the beauty of it. And we get so consumed with being on our phones and being indoors. You know, many people, what I'm seeing at the end of this pandemic that's taken place, at the end of everything that has gone down, the lockdown and the quarantine, people are scared to leave their houses. They've gotten so accustomed to staying behind closed doors that still, even after things are being lifted and opened back up, people aren't even going out anymore. Right. People aren't going out. People, people are they're, they're They're stuck. They they've got into this habit. They've created this habit of living life behind a screen and through the experiences of other people. And this right here, this right now is a, is a call. Maybe if you have the ability to get out this weekend and to do something in nature, I want you guys to get out. Put your phones away for a little bit, man. Put your phones away for a little bit. And, and go take a little bit of time to get out alone with God. Get out in nature. Go down to a beach. Go up to the mountains. Even if it's snowing out there, wherever you're at. I don't know where you guys are at. Get out into the wilderness and just behold the beauty of God. Behold his creation. Behold his creation. Amen. <laughs> San Antonio, they're going out. People are out. I love that. I love that. That's good. So I want to I want to shut it down there and um, I want to pray. I want to pray over today. Amen. We went unplug day. I love that. Just a day to unplug, take a little bit of time off and just enjoy uh, your time with God. He's so good. Listen, man, if nobody's told you this morning or told you today that they love you, I love you. I love you guys. There's 430 of you who decided to show up here live. For those of you who are watching the replay or the uh, listening to the podcast, there's no less love for you. There's love for you guys who have decided to take time out of their day and uh, you know get into the word, take some time in prayer. I love you guys. And uh, you know this is a blessing and an honor that we are able to spend time together on a daily basis. So I really just appreciate you. I appreciate the friendship. I appreciate the community. Um, I am so absolutely grateful for what God is putting together here. I don't know what the end game is. Um, and until I get other instructions, we're going to continue to show up every single day and do what we're doing and having a deeper, better understanding of the Lord, building relationships and friendships, challenging one another, growing in our knowledge of the word and uh, filling ourselves up, right? Just filling our cup so that we can go out into this world and pour into others. Amen. I love you guys. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today. We thank you for the scripture. We thank you for challenging us. We thank you for your divine revelation, for leading us and guiding us. God, ignite a fire within our heart, uh, a heart of curiosity uh, in, in a godly manner to be curious about your word, to want to have better understanding, more wisdom, more knowledge. God, we need you. We need you to enter in. We, want, we know, God, that you are concerned with even the smallest and minute details of our lives. And so, Lord, we invite you into every aspect. We invite you into our relationships, our finances, our friendships, our health, our nutrition, uh, in, into our study habits, into our alone time with you. God, we want you to have your way in our life, every single aspect. Lord, nothing hidden from you. Right now, God, we ask that you would open the, the doors of our heart, that you would go in and that you would search the deepest, darkest chambers and corners and reveal to us any area in our life that we need to surrender to you. Lord, our lives are yours. You paid for them with a price. God, we surrender. We surrender control. God, we want you to take the will. We want you to be the helm. We will, At the helm, we want you to be the captain of our lives. No longer will we take things back into control, uh, you know, lacking faith, lacking trust, God. It's all yours and it's all for you. 
As we leave this place, we pray for our friends, our family members, our loved ones, those who aren't here, those who are absent, those who don't know you. We pray for our political uh, uh, figures, individuals in positions of authority. We lift up our nation. We lift up the world. We lift up the fellowship of believers, the body of Christ. We're asking that uh, you would provide only according to your will. We know that's how you provide, Lord. Help us to have the discernment and understanding that an answer to our prayers might be no. An answer to our prayers might be not yet. Uh, An answer to our prayers, even if it's not what we want, it's what we need. And God, that's what we want. Change our heart. We want what we need. We want what you want for us. That is our prayer. We pray that your will would be done. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. I love you guys. I appreciate you rocking with me every morning. Um, I'm excited to finish Proverbs tomorrow. Because after we finish Proverbs, we get to jump right into Genesis. And uh, you know we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to work our way through um, with some deeper uh, conversations, understanding the context of the Old Testament and just, um, man, allowing God to work in our lives. So have a great day and I will see you guys back here tomorrow. Love you guys.